Happy Sunday, everyone. How are you guys doing? Hey, we want to give thanks to all of our live stream team uh, this morning. Uh, it's truly a lot of challenges uh, with, with the technical difficulties, uh, with the internet and all that stuff. But again, uh, God is good. Today, we want to just uh, abide in His love and just continue uh, to just tune in and lean into Jesus. Amen? Uh, I just want to say thank you so much, guys, for always tuning in and for always supporting us, even though uh, these are also new grounds for us, right? Even with our team, too. But they have done a tremendous job over the past seven months, and I'm truly proud of, of uh, our team here. Um, how many of you know that we are in October, just like what Brian said? Unbelievable, isn't it? We are officially in the final quarter of 2020. I don't know how many of you here are, you know, you cannot wait for 2020 to be over. Um, uh, you know, people said that maybe 2020 is just a dream. Uh, you know, when, when, when we ring the bell and we enter into 2021, uh, it's all a joke, you know. Uh, but 2020 is real. 2020 is here. And, and we just need to continue to just uh, be thankful and just continue to just trust in the Lord as he, uh, as he go through this process together with us. We may not understand it today, why we have to go through what we go through, but we, we just want to believe that the character of our God is always good, is always faithful, and is always loving, right? As we continue uh, the sermon series called Game Plan, I was praying and just reflecting and dwelling in God's presence and asking God, what do you want to speak to your people? What do you want to speak to you today? What do uh, God wants to, uh, what's the game plan for, for my life, for my personal life, for my family, for my ministry, uh, and also for our church, you know, for, for His church and for all of you. So what's the game plan, Lord? You know, and God answered me with a question. So what is your game plan? <laughs> How many of you always have that experience where you ask the Lord question and He, he answered you back with a question? I was like, why? Why you answer, you know, why you answer me with a question? Why don't you just answer me straight with a, with a clear answer so that I, I can... I can clearly go forward and understand your plan. But sometimes God asks us questions so that we will have that personal reflection and conviction to answer those questions. So uh, today my sermon title is called, The Joy of the Lord is Our Strength. The Joy of the Lord is Our Strength. Uh, the question that the Lord asked me, I'm going to forward that to you, right? What is your game plan? What is your game plan for your personal life, for, for, your, uh, for your family, for your ministry, for, for everything that you do in your life? What is your game, game plan? You know, the United States has this pledge. It says that we are to pursue of our own happiness, right? Everybody wants to pursue our own happiness. You know, there is nothing wrong to be happy. There is nothing wrong to want to be happy, you know? But the problem is if we take the pursuit of happiness to be the central theme uh, or the central game plan for our lives, then that becomes a problem. Because if every individual is only focusing on the pursuit of their own happiness, on my own happiness, then they can actually hurt other people in that pursuit, right? Uh, and then it can cause the other person's happiness, the other person's rights in the pursuit of our own happiness. And that becomes a problem. And that's what we are seeing today in this world, in our society, in this civilization, is that everybody is focusing on my own happiness. What is it for me? Right? Uh, and, and so I want to share with you a little bit today. Uh, but before that, I want to begin with, with a joke so that to make you happy. Just in case if you are tuning in so that it can make you happy. So here you go. You know, one day, a wife called her husband. He said, honey, the car is broken and maybe there is water in the engine. And then the husband asked, since when do you know about cars and its mechanics? Where is it now? Where is the car now? The wife said, oh, it's parked in the bottom of the lake. <laughs> A man was in an interview. How many of you are going through interview looking for a job, right? A man was in an interview for a sales position. And the interviewer handed him his newest laptop and said, Here, take it and I want you to try and sell this to me. And the man picked up the laptop and he left and he went home. Eventually, the, the interviewer kept calling him and he said, Hey, bring back my laptop. He said, Pay me $1,000 and it's yours. <laughs> So if you, if you guys uh, 
want to win uh, the job, maybe you need to think outside of the box, right? <laughs> Uh, here are some common ways people pursue happiness. This is what I observed o- over the you know, past however many years of my life. And here are the top four that I found how people uh, pursue their happiness. Number one is that they want to try to make more money. They, in their mind is that if I have more money, if I make more money, then I will be happier. Number two is to buy something to make you happy such as maybe buying a brand new toys, maybe a new car, a new handbag, a new shoes, or whatever that makes you happy, whatever that floats your boat, right? Uh, number three is to pay for experiences to make you happy, such as people paying hundreds and hundreds of dollars or even thousands for family to go to Disneyland uh, to make them happy. They said the happiest uh, place in the world, right? Uh, or maybe uh, some of you like me, we pay to get massages, you know, to relax and be happy. Uh, I don't know, what, what do you pay? Uh, for the experiences to make you happy. Uh, or number four is to buy security. To buy security. What, what does it mean to buy security? Is having roof over your head, maybe having a bed to sleep in, or maybe have uh, a place that you can comfortably lay your head. But if you look at these common ways to pursue happiness, everything has to do with money, right? You know, how many of you have ever heard, money cannot buy happiness? In this room, how many of you have ever heard that? Yeah, it's a lie. It's not completely true, right? Who says money cannot buy happiness? I would rather cry in a BMW than a Pinto. So there is some truth that actually money can buy happiness, but money cannot buy us everlasting happiness. Money can buy us uh, temporal happiness. Come on, don't be too holy. Come on here. Everybody's judging me. It's like, oh, pastor, how can you say that? Money cannot buy happiness. Read your Bible. (laughs) The bottom line is people perceive happiness directly by their money. Of course, there's some truth to that, right? I mean, like, of course, if you go to Disneyland, you're happy, right? Otherwise, why would people pay hundreds and hundreds of dollars to go to Disneyland to make them miserable? The only, thing that, the only thing that I don't understand is that people pay $10 to go to a horror movie to scare them. That I don't understand, right? I always tell my wife, why would I want to pay $20 to go to a horror movie to get the movie to scare me? Life is already scary. I don't even have to pay that. <laughs> okay, joke aside. But what I was trying to convey to you is that happiness, money shouldn't be the central theme for our game plan, for our lives, right? Because otherwise, consequently, our happiness meter becomes the barometer of our identity. The the happiness meter, our happiness meter, becomes the barometer of our identity. If we are not happy, or when we are denied happiness, that means God is evil. That means God is... Uh, God is not loving. That means I'm not loved by God. I'm not loved by my family. Um, And you are rejected. But if you are happy, that means God is pleased with you. That means you are blessed. That's not the barometer of our identity, guys. Right? Because that's, that's, that's the problem with this world. Look at Jesus. He Take a look at Jesus. He came to this world not to look for happiness. He does not come to this world to make this world a happy place like a Disneyland, but he abandoned off of all of his glory, all of his richness, all of his comfort and joy into this world. Why? Because he loves you. And the barometer of our identity shouldn't be the level of our happiness, but the barometer of our identity should be our place with Jesus. In, I, in Isaiah chapter 53, it says this. Isaiah 53 Verse 3 to 5, and and I think we're going to post it to you, and you can read it together with me. He said, Jesus was despised and rejected by mankind. A man of suffering and familiar with pain. Jesus is a man of suffering. He is a man of pain. He understands our suffering. He understands our pain because he is a man of suffering. Like one from whom people hide their faces. He was despised. And we held him in low esteem. That's why there's so many people today still do not want to receive Jesus. That's why many people today still rejected Jesus. 
because he is not a man of full of this wonderful, like a celebrity, you know, but he is a man that understands suffering. Verse 4, surely he took our pain and bore our suffering. Not only he suffered for the sake of suffering, but he took your suffering and your pain and he bore it upon himself. He wasn't selfish, guy, but he was selfless. Yet, we considered him punished by God. When we look upon Jesus on that cross, a lot of people mock at Jesus because they thought that Jesus was being punished by God because that was the standard of the world. Is that when, when we are going through suffering, when we are in pain, people say, oh, you must be punished by God. Haven't you go to church yet? I say, oh, I can't go to church because the church are closed now. Joke's on you. Ha <laughs> ha. Right? But that's what I've heard. Like whenever we get into an uh, accident or there is suffering or there is pain, there is something wrong with our lives, people always say, oh, did God punish you? Did you violate this? Did you do things that you got, uh, you know, you're not supposed to do? And then, oh, you are punished by God. You are cursed by God. Wait a minute. Which God did you worship? Because in Isaiah, my God bore my suffering. My God bore my punishment. And my God died for me. Continue, okay? He said, yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgression, not for his own transgression, not for his mistake, not for his pain, but for our transgression, for your transgression. He was crushed for your iniquity. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wound, we are healed. Man, I love Jesus because He is such a game changer in our lives. You know, there is a, I, I, out of curiosity, I was just looking at the worldview because we are now teaching this apologetics and we are discussing about worldviews, the isms of the world, right? Uh, I want to uh, put a plug for this coming Thursday, 7.30 via Zoom. Uh, we are continuing on session 5 of the apologetic session, and it's called Hedonism. So join us, and you will learn more about, about uh, the ism of the, family, uh, of the world, right? And I was researching about this worldview, uh, and, and I want to know, what does the world think about happiness? How do you obtain happiness, right? Uh, and, and here's are some of the things that I found. There is a Chinese saying. How many of you Chinese always have good saying, very wise saying? Right, you know, I can imagine this old man with a, with a long beard, like, hmm. He said, if you want happiness for an hour, take a nap. <laughs> if you want happiness for the day, go fishing. <laughs> if you want happiness for a year, inherit a fortune. If you want happiness for a lifetime, help somebody. And then I went through a modern scientific research, and I found an article in uh, the Time magazine, uh, and it says this. And I, let me read it, okay? He says, the resounding answer is yes. Scientific research provides compelling data to support the anecdotal evidence that giving is a powerful pathway to personal growth and lasting happiness. Giving. Through MRI technology, we now know that giving activities the same parts of the brain that stimulated by food and experiments show evidence that altruism is hardwired in the brain and is pleasurable. Helping others may just be the secret to living life that is not only happier, but also healthier, wealthier, more productive, and meaningful. So the Chinese was right. The Chinese was right that if you want a lifetime of happiness, help others. That's the scientific research and the Chinese worldview, right? <laughs> this is also actually supported by Jesus. In 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9, 2 Corinthians verse 8, chapter 8, verse 9, he says, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though He was rich, yet for your sake, come on, not for Jesus' sake, not for His own sake, but for your sake, He became poor. So that you, through his poverty, might become rich. The world, you know, the person of Jesus is, is just very unique. His being, his character is so counter-cultural, right? 
In the world, to be accepted or to be acknowledged, the world says, achieve. To be happy, the world says, have. And to be a go-getter, the world says, do. But the gospel said, Jesus laid down his life so that you can achieve the payment of sin and receive salvation. He came not to be served, but to serve. It's not for you to achieve because it is already achieved. It is already finished on the cross. It is not for you to seek to have, but it's already imputed on, uh, in you by the blood of Jesus. It is not for you to do, to receive that acceptance, but it is to rest in Jesus. So Jesus is just countercultural. You know, uh, when the world says, you know what, you, in order for you to be successful, you need to be a go-getter. But Jesus said, in order for you to achieve success, is for you to be a go-giver. It's opposite. Jesus is so opposite. If you want to be a leader, you have to humble yourself and serve. While the world said, if I want to be a leader, I have to make use of all of the people under me so that I can step on them, so that I can be higher and higher. But Jesus said, to be a leader, you have to go lower and lower so that your disciples and people around you can be higher and higher. So countercultural. But that is my Jesus. Amen? But I want you to know, come on, Christians are not a boring, dull, unhappy people. <laughs> right? I'm not a boring, unhappy people. I'm happy. And I have lots of fun. Amen? <laughs> but we are not unhappy people. We are not a boring people. We are not a dull people. We are not people that are strapped by the burdens of the do's and the don'ts of, of God's. That misperception makes Christianity so unattractive. And, and tune in with us this Thursday and you will know that our God actually designed us to have pleasure. He designed us to have not only happiness, but God designed us to have joy. And joy is everlasting happiness despite of circumstances. That's the definition of joy. Amen? And I want to close with this. Psalm 28. Psalm 28. And we, we're going to uh, prepare our hearts to partake on the Holy Communion. To those of you who have been seeking in the pursuit of your happiness, and in that pursuit, and in that plan, in that ways, you found yourself stumbling and not getting that happiness that you want. I want to ask you today to lean in and listen to this verse. Because the pursuit of happiness shouldn't be our central game plan, right? Here's Psalm 28. It says, The Lord is my strength and my shield. I trust Him with all of my heart. He helps me and my heart is filled with joy. You want happiness? You want to have a joyful life? You want to be an overcomer? You want to have the strength to live this life? Trust in Jesus. Invite Jesus into your life. And then it says this in Psalm 28 verse 7, I burst out in songs of thanksgiving. Oh, I love this worship team today. Man, when they sing, not only they sing with their mouth, but the expression is so awesome. You know, like, they are so into it. They burst out into thanksgiving because there is joy in them. Amen? Amen. amen. They have to say amen because they are here. <laughs> So the central theme of our lives should be to let Jesus be the central in our lives. The central theme of our lives should be to let Jesus be central in our lives. So today, there is an invitation. Let's partake this Holy Communion, reminding ourselves that Jesus, the joy of the Lord, is my strength. It's not the pursuit of happiness. The game plan is not to be happy and to measure whether we are accepted by God, whether we are good relationship with God by the level of our happiness and the level of our blessedness. It's not about that, right? The, the level of our, our joy is not based on the level of our happiness. The barometer of our identity is what Jesus had done on the cross. He laid out His life. He laid down His life so that you and I, we can rest in His finished work. It is all done for you. All you have to do today is just make that decision 
I know some of you might have difficulty making that decision, but today I want you to make that decision. So as we partake in this Holy Communion, I want you to take this invitation and receive Jesus. Amen? As they sing this song, to those of you who have not prepared your bread and cup or crackers and cup, go ahead and take those. And then we'll come back and partake it together. Amen?